call and response. Uh, thank you all for coming. Now I can't see any of you. Um, thank you all for coming to tonight's performance and Q&A. Uh, before we start, a couple of very brief announcements. Um, first, we want to thank the De Flores Fund for Humor uh, for helping us put this on. If you have any funny ideas, please apply to the De Flores Fund. Uh, we can approve grants of $750 at any time uh, and grants more than that twice a year. Um, there is a mailing list uh, for the communications form, which this is a part of, right outside there on a table. If you sign up for that, we will only send you emails about events. Um, so you'll get between five and six emails a year. But if you want to be kept informed about things like this, please do that. Um, there are also materials from the Title IX and Violence Prevention and Response Office on the table outside. Um, tonight, we are all here to see Cameron Esposito, uh, who is a nationally headlining comedian. Um, she has appeared in feature films on Comedy Central, uh, on HBO. Uh, she's to write a column for the AV Club. Um, she, has, uh, she has been a part of several incredible podcasts. Her most recent comedy special uh, is one that I cannot recommend highly enough. Um, it's called Rape Jokes, uh, and it deals with sexual assault from a survivor's perspective. And it has so, th so far raised more than $95,000 for the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. Um, it is available for streaming on her website, Cameron Esposito. Uh, before we call her out, a couple of very uh, quick guidelines for tonight. You are welcome to take pictures as long as there are no flash. Um, please do not uh, make any video recordings, but pictures are fine. Um, and uh, please no audio recordings. After Cameron does her stand-up set, we're going to do a brief Q&A and then an audience Q&A. Um, so don't leave when she is done. Uh, and with that, will you please join me in giving a big welcome to Cameron Esposito. So now, um, I'm going to do a stand-up set, <clears throat> 45 minutes or so. Um, uh, a couple of other uh, quick announcements before we go on. In my excitement to get Cameron out here, um, I neglected to thank two other uh, places at MIT that helped us put this on, the Mind, Hand, Heart Innovation Fund um, and Women and Gender Studies at MIT. Uh, both of whom um, did a lot to help make this happen. Um, so the way this is going to work, Cameron and I are going to talk for uh, a little while. We'll open it up to you. Um, we have two microphones. Uh, so during the Q&A part, you can come down and stand at the mic. If you are unable to come down uh, to the mic for some reason, just raise your hand and we will get a mic to you. Um, also, before we start this portion, uh, it's possible that during this section of the night, we're going to talk about a topic that might bring up something in some of you, and we want to know that you do have support. Um, violence Prevention and Response is MIT's confidential resource for sexual assault, stalking, harassment, and sexual harassment. Um, and what confidential means in this context, there are uh, university employees typically are required to report um, sexual harassment or sexual assault under Title IX laws. Violence prevention and response is a place where you can go and talk to them confidentially. They do not give your name to anyone. There is not a, a report that needs to come out of that. That is up to you. Uh, they have a 24-hour hotline, and there's also an advocate here, uh, Alessandra, who can offer support. Um, the hotline number is 617-253-2300. Uh, and again, there's a violence prevention and response um, table right outside, uh, along with the communications form sign-up sheet, uh, which we hope you sign up for. So, I'll move over here. Sort of thought I should like get get down. On the, I was gonna sit down on the ground. All right. This is so satisfying. I mean, I might take this out, but it's just so. Isn't it cute? It just feels so little. Do I feel like a giant. Well, I think this is like this is like a table guy. A table. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. But 
just seeing it on the floor like that, <laughs> sweetest thing I ever saw. Right. Yeah, no, I know, I know. <laughs> I know. Have you used a microphone before? It's yes, like I know, but it's just this part, so this is fun. <laughs> it's the world's most ineffective boom mic. <laughs> You're, you're in the shot. No, I know. It's, I just only have so much. Um, so thank you for coming. Oh, yes. We're, we're, we'll, we'll quiz you on the different course numbers later. Uh, that was I, a fun part of the show. I still don't. I have no idea what they are, and I've been here for nine years, I think. So um, people say, like, I'm in course three, and I just nod. Woo! There you go. Somebody's really a fan of course three. Um, so, uh, well, I wanted to ask first about, um, about your special, uh, yeah. Rape Jokes. Um, uh, what made you, uh, what brought that about? What made you want to do that? And we haven't talked at all about it. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about what that special is. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, um, it's an hour about sexual assault from my first person perspective as a survivor. And, um, I put it out for free on my website. And I know you mentioned this in my intro, but I'll just say this all to you because, you know, I know these are times where you can, it just can feel so overwhelming, like, is there even anything good in the world sometimes? And um, so you can watch it for free, and then there's an option where you can choose to donate. And so folks have chosen to donate over $95,000. Like, it's a for free thing. So that, to me, it gives me a lot of hope, and I really love that. Um, so just shout out to all of the human beings that are, that felt, um, affected enough. And I, I got a chance to go to, uh, RAIN is the uh, world, the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization. I got a chance to join um, the organization on their advisory council and to go to see um, the room where they take phone calls. And so this has been a really wonderful process for me. And the process of making that special was, um, I woke up in the middle of the night and I just like had that title in my head because rape jokes are it's like been, it's one of those things that's been debated uh, for as long as I've been doing comedy. Like, are there certain topics that are off limits? And it's like, it's, it just strikes me as utter silliness because when people are talking about something like sexual assault, first of all, there always seems to be this implied difference that men and women feel differently about sexual assault. And I find that in my anecdotal evidence or uh, experience, that is not true. Like, I know a lot of men who um, either are survivors themselves or who, like, came up to me and um, told me how much this affected them. So, like, I kind of think a lot of us are on the same side, which is the side of justice. That's the first thing. Um, and good communication and better education because one of our biggest problems, I think, as a country is that we don't have sex ed. So how can you know when, whether or not you're doing something consensual? Um, but but uh, the other thing I hear often when I hear people talk about rape jokes is like, there'll be just a comic will go out and say something that's just deliberately offensive or um, obtuse in some way and then get upset that the audience wants more from them as a comic. Like, don't be offended, like, buck up and, and censorship. And it's like sort of the stuff I was talking about um, during my set. And I, I just think, like, if you're a comic and somebody tells you, hey, be more careful with this thing that has really affected real people, um, that you should want to be a good enough artist to make better jokes. Like, that, that somebody giving you feedback is an opportunity to improve your art. Right. And especially, I also always assume there are survivors in the room because I'm a survivor. So we all, it's also something that we talk about as if like there's nobody affected by it. It's one of those topics that we just trot out to talk about as if it only affects people outside the room. Right. And statistically, it affects people in every single room that we're in. Right. So um, yeah, I just think there's a huge shift that we could make and I was happy with, the, with Rape Jokes for just doing a tiny bit to well, at least to get my opinion out there. And, and for people who haven't seen it, and then when you do donate, it's very cool because like two seconds later you get an email from Cameron that says thank you. And I was like, oh my God, you're, you're so welcome. Uh, um, I imagined you every individual time. Thank you so much, Seth Manukin. 
Um, uh, and so, so what has the experience of, of then um, of, of taking that out and, and, and talking to people after uh, that show and after you do, um, do, do that stand-up, what has that experience been like with audiences? Well, um, I, only, I only did that material in really small rooms mm. because I didn't feel like it was something where I could come out in like a... Like when I'm here in Boston, I often play the Wilbur and like that's a big, beautiful room, but I didn't feel like I could go into the Wilbur and like bring up this topic um, and then just sort of like leave. Um, so I only did it in rooms that were um, 100 max people and sometimes smaller than that. Um, because I wanted to like have a chance to be with the audience afterwards. Because a lot of times people would out themselves to me as survivors, or that they had survivors in their family, or just have a chance to like connect on it. And it just felt to me like I didn't feel like it was like, something I could come out and dump on an audience. Even right. though it's like, it's not like a heavy special. It's real, and there are parts that aren't funny, but it's it's not like to do damage. But I just felt like there was some aftercare required. Right. Yeah. Right. So it was like really intimate audiences and I and I heard directly from a lot of people. That's not usually my experience. I play bigger rooms than that now and um, so sometimes there's like a really big line and uh, I'm not, I'm trying to not sound arrogant, but it's just true. much bigger rooms now. Yeah, I play bigger rooms now so there's like a much bigger line so it just, it's um, not as easy to be with individual people because there's like a bunch of people behind so you like try to keep it moving. Right. Yeah, but that didn't feel like what I could do for this. And and is that um, so? Now that you've you've done that special, do you think you will continue to do that in smaller rooms, or are you moving on to other? Yeah, I will never do that material again. I don't think some of it was in here, but like as the hour that right. exists, like I don't think I'll ever do it again. Um, I was so lucky to get a chance to. This was like the coolest project because also people donated their time, which is something I'd never ask folks to to donate for things that they should be paid for. But in this case, I knew that all the money was going to be donated, and I knew I was donating my time, so I felt a little bit more comfortable. Um, and I just feel like I captured exactly what I wanted to capture, and I think it's like, I'm very proud of it, and uh, it exists, and I feel like now I can move on a right. little bit. I got um, to say my piece. And that's more than most people get to do, yeah. Right. Um, Moving back a bit, uh, you obviously were not, you didn't major in comedy in college. Um, uh, was, uh, what got you into improv? It sounds like pretty much right after school you, you started getting involved in improv. Yeah, well actually, at BC has the, weirdly has the oldest collegiate improv group in the country. It's called My Mother's Fleabag. It still exists. Um, Amy Poehler was in it 10 years before I was. And so when I was at school, Amy was like just breaking out on SNL. Right. So there was this feeling like, oh, all you do is just like act like a banana <laughs> in the cafeteria for like th three nights a month or whatever. And then like you get to be a famous person, you know? Um, and... I got my first job working professionally in improv the day after I graduated. So it's, I've always, since the day after I graduated from school, I've been working professionally in comedy. And did you always know you wanted to perform? I mean, it sounds like you were a, a, a cardinal, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was just a red wing? You oh, know, okay. that bird. Right. Yes, right, right. <laughs> um. <laughs> um, no, I was, a, I was a jock. I played right. a lot of sports. You have those incredible ligaments. I mean, I don't yeah, want to yeah, yeah. I have those <laughs> like. Um, I was like a three-sport athlete in high school, and um, and I was like on student council and stuff like that. I was like very involved. The person setting up for the dances, and if you can, if you remember that person, like the person's like putting streamers everywhere all the time. Um, and uh, then at BC, I played rugby. Um, wow. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. What? Yeah. Oh, it's a delayed rugby woo. Um, yeah. Yeah, I played rugby. So, um, yeah, I, I didn't know about... Well, that's why I asked some of you, like, like, what you're studying, because I really didn't know this was a job. I went to, like, a college prep high school, and I really didn't know anybody that wasn't Catholic, and I, I didn't know that arts and entertainment... Like, I would see people on TV, and I didn't understand... I, I think maybe I still had like 
almost like an infant's understanding of like they live in the in the TV. Like I just, right. you know, like I like it's crowded and they have to share a bed. There's a lot of them. Um, yeah, I didn't know this was a job, so. I, I even didn't know it was a job after I was doing it professionally. Like, I, I applied to go to grad school and I started getting my master's in social work. I, when, I worked, when I lived out here, I worked in special ed um, with kids with severe physical special needs. And so I was, still, I was doing comedy at night. I had other stuff that I thought would be my career. Mm -hmm. I thought comedy would be my passion. You could have been a, an uplift driver. That's right. I could have been an uplift driver. <laughs> Too true. Things had gone a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and, and you're a comedian, obviously. This is true of, of most stand-ups who talks a lot about your own life, um, shares very intimate things. Um, we now live in a culture where the audience, the world at large, feels like they have a right to interact with anyone who's famous in any way, in any manner. Uh, what is that experience like? I, I would guess that you're dealing with difficult subjects, that not all of the comments you get are fully supportive. Oh yeah, that's a good question. Well, I have a new approach to social media um, these days where like, I really am not ever on anything. Um, so I don't see as, I don't see as much as many comments, even like the positive comments too. Right. I don't really see as much as I used to. Um, during the first maybe say ten years of my career, it was I pretty much only got uh, discouragement. If that makes any sense, right. you know, like people that I worked with, other comics um, sometimes were kind to me, or like there were a lot of improvisers here in Boston who m made me think I could do this job. Um, but I don't know if this is gonna like shock any of you. We were talking about this backstage. I am like truly the first, part of the first generation of comics that could start out. You know, Ellen, was well into her career and with her own television show when she came out in the 90s and then was blacklisted and had to like literally go away for a while before she reemerged as a fish. And <laughs> this is all real. And like Tig Notaro, who's maybe in the, like it may be one generation um, ahead of me, you know, wasn't, a, wasn't maybe cl like not closeted, but like not, not out, like, didn't start talking about her life, her personal life. Right. Um, and I'm just naming those people. That's true of, like, everybody in that generation, you know, like, a lot. Of, well, not everybody. There were some people that were out, like, Leah Delaria, who's, who's, like, now on Orange is the New Black, has been out forever. But she got Orange is the New Black, and she's 60. You know, right. like, she right. got that job five years ago or whatever that is, you know. So, you know, that's how long it took for somebody who started out to have mainstream success. And I'm really part of the first generation that like got to be out the whole time. So yeah, for 10 years, that was really, really difficult for people. Like I basically just got told to shut up <laughs> or like talk about something else. Why do you have to talk about being gay? Talk about something else. And I'm like, well, do you want me to well, talk about being straight? Like I don't. <laughs> and also, I mean, straight male comedians never talk about their sex life. So it makes That's sense. That's true. That it's <laughs> honestly, what do they have sex? I don't know. <laughs> How does it look when they jerk off? I don't right. know. I've never seen it, you know? Right. Um, you know, so it was weird. Right. Yeah. And, and so now, 10 years into your career, um, uh, is that, do you see uh, that being sort of the same for men and women in, in the LGBTQI community, or is, it, is there something different? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Well, actually, just to give like a... Could you speak for all gay men? Yeah, yeah, I will. I will. Women? Well, just to give like more accurate information, I'm actually like 15 years in now, so I'm not right. saying that to... But what I mean is the first 10 were really hard, then the last five have been really interesting where I've been getting like rewarded right. uh, for being an unusual voice, and I'm like, wait, what? Like, I almost don't trust it. Um, I will say it. It is, it is true that there has never been an out 
gay male mega star in the stand-up world. Um, there also hasn't really been a mega star that's like trans person or a non-binary person. If you think about it, that that's like, wow, that's true. And um, I think some of that is who has been cultured to like take up space. Um, you know, I think a lot of times, like it's just a numbers game that, oh wow, I guess I'll get into like some gender theory or whatever, but like, like uh, there are a lot of lesbians who do stand up because we don't care what men think of us. And it's very difficult to be a woman. Well, we do, I mean, I still do, of course. I'm cultured female, of course I care what men think about me. Accept me, think I'm beautiful. Like, it's just, like I don't even, I don't want you at all, but could you like please validate me? It's very confusing. Um, <laughs> But I think if you're a straight woman, you know, uh, I could like really get into this. Laughter is a submissive behavior. I don't know if we, if we know this, but like, I don't know. I read this, I've read like studies and like books on it. It's a submissive, um, the person that's on stage is like the leader, they're dominating uh, you. And that, can, and that can feel really good. Like it actually can feel really nice to be like held in that way. But I think sometimes for men, if that's a woman, she's a straight woman, um, she's then gonna have like, her life is gonna be hard. She's gonna have a difficult time dating. She's gonna have a difficult time um, figuring out how to find a partner because her partner is cultured to be threatened by her. And I think that same thing kind of then extends to gay men where it's like homophobia against gay men is actually really misogyny because we hate the idea that like being penetrated is like the worst thing that can happen to you. And we think about gay men as a society, we think about like the, the sex act that gay men um, do that also uh, like a ton of straight people do, but for some reason is like really gay, it's confusing. <laughs> Women also have buttholes, there's a lot, you know? <laughs> but I think that when, you know, I bring up all that, that all sounds like very tangential stuff, but like, you know, stand-up is like everything else where the, all the same gender dynamics play out. And um, I really, I can't wait to see who the first like gay male megastar is. Maybe Jabuki Young White, he's, uh, he's um, on The Daily Show now. Um, or maybe Joel Kim Booster. And, um, but uh, yeah. That'll happen someday. There, there was one thing um, that you said in your special that I loved, and I hope I wrote down, and I probably didn't. Um, I did not, or I took the wrong piece of paper. But um, uh, um, it was something you were talking about, uh, basketball shorts guy. Yeah. Um, and uh, Which is like a character in the special, basketball shorts guy. He's a, he's a you actually nailed it, yeah. And, but, and you said something like, uh, it, it was like, um, you know, stand up. Get in the way. Get in the way. Right? Yeah. See, I didn't even need to write it down. Yeah. Um, uh, I know my, you, you could ask me. Yeah, I, I'll tell you. Um, and, and, and I thought that was, that was really interesting because, um, uh, you know, b people will come to me because I, 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 I'm a professor or for whatever reason they'll look for me for advice and they'll say, well, what can I do? I'm, I feel helpless in this situation, this geopolitical situation, what can I do? And I thought that was really interesting without asking you to get into the whole thing. What does that mean? Like, what is that, what was he embodying there? Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe like get a little bit specific with the story then I'll tell you a little bit about how I've applied it in other ways and, and then um, this would be like, not to do your job, but I bet this would be like a really good lead in because for, for, for other questions, because I feel like... Should we go in confab and then... I, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just, I feel like this is going to be, there's going to be some, like, cool questions maybe that come from this. Um, so this moment that you're talking about is, um, you know, I was an undergrad uh, when I was assaulted, and it was a friend, and um, that person later approached me and was very aggressive with me, and it was another student, um, a, a dude, who like stepped between us and he like, it was a, I literally don't even remember this guy's name. Like that is how indelible he as an individual was on in my life. That's how close friends we were, not really close friends, the person who stepped between. But still like in passing, this person has like changed my life. 
And I think about how like he could have absolutely have chosen to just walk by and let this scene play out, and instead he stepped between. And that is something that I'm so grateful for, you know, in that situation. And it's also um, what I'm trying to do in the world with my career. When I make a special, make it available for, for free, I'm, where you don't have to sign up for a, service, a streaming service or pay for a subscription or for cable or whatever, I'm trying to like interrupt this um, system that we live in. Or I had a television show for a while that was called Take My Wife, and um, a very low budget television show. And we uh, made a decision to uh, go for these really specific numbers in terms of diversity, like uh, an all female writer's room that was also 40% um, women of color. And then also our cast was. Um, over 50% out LGBT actors. And when our show um, was canceled because our streaming service was dis like was um, went defunct, our show wasn't really canceled, but we were able to release these numbers. And we have these, you know, this is a, a show that operated at like the 10th of a budget that a show on HBO would be at, or like a 20th of a show on network television. And we had these numbers, these diversity numbers that, that it like trended on Twitter and a, a lot of um, media outlets picked up these numbers. And because like we deliberately designed it so that it's like, well, we have like no money and money is time. So we're making this show faster than you're making your show. But we just went in with a mandate and this is what we were able to do. And being able to release those numbers felt, again, to me, it's like these little moments to disrupt the system, like put a challenge out to other people who are in a position to hire folks. Like, here's what I was able to do, you know, improve on this. And um, yeah, so that's what I've tried to do in my career thus far, and I think that's hopefully what I'll continue to get to do. And that, and cool. And a after the streaming service shut down, mm -hmm. then it was picked up. Right, it, it, it did Yeah, go Stars on. bought the show, so Stars is, you can watch it on Stars. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, uh, another thing that I thought was was really fascinating about um, about your special, about getting it online, is that you don't, uh, you don't even need to sign up for a newsletter. You can just yeah. go on and, and, and watch it. Yeah, you can just press play. That's all you have to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's worth doing. <laughs> cool. Um, uh, why don't we open it up um, to the audience, uh, and again, come down to either one of the mics. It doesn't seem like a super shy crowd, but oftentimes it takes one person to, uh, um, to get things started. Um, while we're waiting for that, uh, um, are you working on um, another special, a, a show? What, what else are you working on? At the yeah, moment? I'm about to go, well, I was working on a new hour this fall, but I also I just turned in the second draft of a book. Ooh. Wow! <laughs> I'm out trying to sell a new TV show right now. We'll see what happens there, but um, I'm in LA a lot, and then I'm gonna go back out on the road, and I'm gonna work on the next hour of material. But yeah, you know, I don't know. Still chugging along. Do Who you, has a question? Oh, yeah, go, you know, you go ahead. Do you, do you enjoy being on the road? Oh, it is so lonely. <laughs> it is so lonely. It's so lonely being on the road. It's also so nice. I love my job, but sometimes I wish I could go home and see my dog. What kind of dog do you have? I have a nine pound chihuahua. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> He's a sweetie. Hi. Oh. <laughs> uh, so I'm an engineer, but I um, also am a poet and I'm starting to perform my poetry. And I was wondering, because I saw rape jokes and I really liked it and it meant a lot to me, how do you as a performer walk the line of trying to talk about really difficult experiences um, and trying to talk about stuff that isn't talked about enough, but also keeping in mind the fact that there is an audience that might be affected and might have feels to your feels? Sure, you mean like, what do I do about the fact that there might be that a survivor? Yeah, like what is what is your perspective on like trying to navigate that space? Yeah, I mean, I just feel like um, I try to be pretty conscientious 
as conscientious as I can be. But that being said, like, I am just one person. And one thing that I think helps a lot is to make sure that you're investigating your own experience and really speaking only for yourself. Because that's why I felt like I could do a special like rape jokes. Because I felt like, well, I'm not trying to speak about rape culture. I'm trying to speak about my experience. And the more specific and the more personal I am, the more that speaks about rape culture. So I just, I find that like, you know, that is how we do the best work is when we just try to speak only for ourselves. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's such a good question. Um, uh, first quick thing is I, one, did you know our, our class numbers also, our classes are also by numbers, not just our courses, so I thought you might find that wow, interesting. everything's <laughs> awesome here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what I want to say is, like, I don't know, every gay person, you know, has their, like, journey of, like, figuring out they're gay and whatnot, and for me, there's, like, a huge, like, time in my life when I didn't realize I could be gay, and then I watched BuzzFeed's Ask a Lesbian featuring you. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> You're welcome. That's pretty much how I realized, like, I could be gay, slash, like, definitely was. Um, so that's sort of, like, my turning point in my, like, I don't know, in my life a little bit, me, like, in the hallway watching this video. And so, like, you mean a lot to me, and I was wondering if it'd be possible to get an autograph either now or after the show. Um, but I brought, yes. a, I, I brought a Sharpie. Good. <laughs> That's so cool. That's the that's the whole goal is uh, convert lesbians. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, the whole goal is uh, I really and I don't. I'm not saying this to like to be overly sad or anything, but I really didn't have anybody. You know, I really have tried to be the person I didn't have, like for my own little baby self. Like I used to, when I was at BC, my girlfriend and I, we used to take the train to Davis Square to go to the Diesel Cafe, <laughs> where there's just like haircuts. And I don't know if you are, I don't know if you, that is in a two hour, Tea journey, like that is like those could not be further apart. We would just go there. I don't even think we, I don't even think we ever ordered. We would just walk in and go like, oh, <laughs> and then like leave, you know. So I, I really think it matters to see, um, you know, to see what you could possibly be. So thank you for telling me that. It was a very nice story. I, I got to learn how lesbians use condoms from your. Yeah! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> The answer is as dream catchers. Yes, as dream catchers. You lay them on the windowsill to dry, you make a dream catcher. <laughs> I just laughed at my own joke. Yes. Okay, so I am from Wellesley, where we do not have numbers um, as our majors, and there's also a lot of lesbians, you may have heard. Um, so I am the adopted daughter of lesbians, and I really love your show, Take My Wife, and I'm also queer myself, and, I'm and I really loved the scene where you discuss adoption, and I'm wondering if you could sort of elaborate on the story behind creating that. Oh, wow. Oh, thank you so... First of all, yay. Thank you for... You came here from Wellesley? Yes. Thank you so much for making I that trip. I was so excited. That's so here. rad. Yay. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Oh, my God. That sh I, I, like, am having a complete blackout on specifically what the dialogue is, only because... Um, I've done so much performing since only then. Because you haven't memorized every single thing you've ever done. Yeah, yeah. But um, what what is true about that sh about take my wife is that um, I made it with uh, my wife uh, Rhea Butcher, and um, it was the coolest experience making that show because what we got to do was talk about things that are real for queer folks, 
and then to a room of people and um, some of our writers were queer and then some of our writers were not queer and so we would write these scripts that included like, um, you know, talking about like how expensive adoption is or like how you don't know what you're gonna do with your eggs or like how are you gonna get kids? You're gonna buy or steal them? Like what are you gonna do? And <laughs> you know, we would write these jokes and then here's the other thing that we did that like I'm actually so proud of is we, we hired um, additional queer folks to come in and did a table read like for just queer people to be like, is there anything in here that doesn't ring like as true as it could be for like our community or how much, where could we get more specific and stuff like that. So it's literally like two queer showrunners and then with some queer writers and then doing like, we did literally, we called it a gay pass. Like just do an additional, <laughs> you know, pass on top of that, and then also h tried to hire out LGBT actors so that the things that were coming out of our mouths were things that we had lived experience with. And I just, I look at, you know, what other, I'm not trying to pass judgment, but I look at like, like there are some really great movies, um, but so often when queer characters pop up in shows, it's like a random room of straight writers trying to address a topic. And then that's when you get like weird like jokes about closets and you're like that what you know like you know what I mean it's like um so I think on everything in that in that show it was like just trying to make something that felt really honest I'm so glad you like it yeah it was really life-changing to be honest oh man can I, I was see? like in high school oh and my I wasn't god. sure if I was gay oh my god I was like oh I can't be gay because my parents are gay and then all the antis <laughs> were like that's true oh, then I'll be supporting the antis and yeah and wow oh my god well tell your folks I say hi and <laughs> Wouldn't, I'm so glad that, yeah. thank you so much for telling me yeah, you. about your life, and yeah, rock on. Hello, friend. Hi. Hello. Um, my name is Sam. What's and, up, Sam? Uh, really, really happy to be here. Thank <laughs> you so much for coming, and thank you yeah. for championing the message that diversity is part of what makes this country good. Because yes. that's, like, really important. Um, I enjoyed hearing the snippet of story about a uh, basketball shorts dude um, yeah. and how he was able to step in and be an ally. I'm part of the uh, business school allies group for men who are trying to, like... Whoa. Yeah. Moons. What? Yeah, That's amazing that that even exists. Well, thank the you. The business I, school allies group? No, like, we are literally there? That it's that specific? That's fucking awesome. All right, yeah, there, keep going, yes? I mean, we accept all allies, but yeah, it's just like... Yeah, no, I love this. This is making me happy. Locally, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, my question is basically about how to encourage more people to be allies. Um, mm. Not just how can I be better, which I would also appreciate your your advice, uh, yeah. but how to how to get more people to recognize the need and understand how they can take action. That's such a good question, and I I would say for me the only solution that has ever worked um, is telling, and it's like not unlike this this answer that I gave to mm. you. It's like is um, telling people why something matters to me. Mm. Like, I just, I really feel like we're we're in this moment where it feels like we sh like the inclination is often to like address a massive social issue. Sure. But I find that that can turn people off, you know, or even overwhelm people. It's like literally why I think stand-up is a valuable art because you're on, you're, you're on stage talking about like, here's my experience, here's my experience, and you're not saying, you're not, it's not like instructive. It's not like, here's what you should do. So, I mean, I would say something that, like, if I were in your shoes, I could imagine, like, you're, you know, hanging out with some buddies or whatever, and you just talk about this thing that you're doing and why mm. it's important to you. And, like, let them decide whether or not they want to come in your direction. But I just, I think often, you know, attraction works um, better than... Um, like evan evangelization. Do you sure. know what I'm saying? Totally. So I, I think that like just talking about what you already do here in this room, now people know that's a thing that exists or whatever. And like I think that's I think that's one way to do it. Cool. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Cool. Yeah, cool. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, go, go, go. But I want it to be over here. <laughs> wow. Wow. I didn't walk all the way around. No, so I, I know. I feel 
Wow. Um, First of all, like that, way to know yourself. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, oh, yeah, it's because I'm Cuban, I guess. So, again, this is one thank of those moments knowing. where it's slightly weird to yell. <laughs> I'm okay with fingers in being pointed in at me. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm very vocal about my ethnicity. It's okay. Good, good, good. Um, I don't remember what I was going to say, but stuff. Um, I think it would be really great if we could have a little bit of an uplift session. Um, <laughs> that would be really fantastic, um, especially considering no pressure, but hearing your stand-up for, like, I don't know, the past, like, 17,000 years. Um, I've, I've been listening to you, like, for forever. Oh, wow. And actually, because of my older sister, who is also gay, sorry, parents. Um, <laughs> You're welcome, parents. <laughs> You're like, we're like <laughs> Tegan and Sarah, but we're not the same age. Exactly. You don't know, we could become a lucrative band. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That would be fantastic. Would be fantastic. <laughs> um, but, but, like, growing up Catholic and, like, you know, my high school's experience from your stand-up has seems very similar to yours, um, so no pressure, but your advice means a lot to me um, already. <laughs> Even though you haven't given it to me, it already means a lot. Um, and I recently just stood up in front of a crowd and talked about two, inst two instances of sexual assault that happened to me. Um, it took me a while to like accept it because it was a girl, and I was like, oh, I probably just didn't say no loud enough because it wasn't a dude who was forcing himself on me. Um, and so I recently just like st stood up in front of a crowd and talked about it, which was really powerful. And I'm also currently taking a political class at Harvard, which is <laughs> interesting. Um, <laughs> um, and so right now I'm, at a, I'm a senior. I'm senior spring um, and I'm graduating and I'm like, what the fuck am I gonna do with my life, right? And thinking about that experience I had that was super powerful, talking about um, like not on, only LGBTQ stuff, but also sexual assault. I'm in front of a crowd of people. I'm like, do I you know, go into politics and change laws? Do I do stand-up comedy? Because that's also kind of a secret dream of mine. Um, <laughs> um, and like talk about it through humor, because like that's how I you know, talk about my feelings through humor. Um, and, or do I like just join a bunch of organizations like Fenway Health and things like that? Um, and just like, what, how do I, how do I make a difference? How do I make an impact? Or is it just like, that's, that's where I'm at. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm so sorry uh, that that happened to you. And thank you for, thank you for telling me. And, um, second of all, I want to say that, um, I think you're at an age where maybe you don't need to have the answer to that question and that investigation and information is so helpful. You know, I, I remember um, how overwhelmed I felt at this time and like, it's not like now in my life I never feel, I cer certainly have decisions again where I'm like, is this the right thing to do next? And sometimes in my mind I can get I can worry about, is this the right thing? Will this be the right thing to do in 10 years or something like that? And that's very hard to know. The thing that you can know is like, what's the first step that you can take? So like the first step that you could take if you were gonna be a stand-up is to go to an open mic and sign up and go on stage. And the first step that you could take if you want to be a politician is like probably to take the LSAT, you know? like. <laughs> And the, you know, and the first step for joining those organizations is maybe to join one of them and go to a meeting and see how that feels. So I, I would just say, like, I know if there's all this pressure and it feels like you have to know the answer. But like I said, I did, I mean, I didn't start doing stand-up full-time or comedy full-time as my job until um, I was, like, 27. So, you know, 22 to 27, five years. And sometimes people, sometimes it takes people, you know, much, much longer than that or whatever. But, you know, I spent five years doing multiple things to figure out what was the right thing for me. And um, that's okay, too. So I just would say the advice is to take the, the first step, see if you like it, then take the sep second step. And not worry about changing the world, mm -hmm. but worry about what you like. 
That was incredible. Is my first step giving you five, five stars? Yes, that's it. Five stars. They, five stars. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, this person. Oh, I'm so sorry. Probably have. Hi. <laughs> Everybody's killing it. We, we probably have time for one or two, maybe more questions. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here tonight. I've also listened uh, listened a lot to you, uh, like especially my, like, at the beginning of my college years. I'm a senior now, and it did mean a lot to me. And I specifically have a question for you because at some point um, in your life, you've been very Catholic, and now you're very gay again. <laughs> 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 I, I'm a math student, so I proceed like this, but... <laughs> I, I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. Um, the same is true for me, except that I grew up in very Catholic Italy. And uh, for some reason, it never occurred to me that there was something wrong with like being Catholic and being gay, just because I didn't feel quite as much homophobia in Italy even though I used to go to church regularly and like everything. And then um, when I came to the US as a college freshman, that's the first moment in which I realized, oh wait, there are people who have problems with me being like gay and Catholic at the same time. And well, that, that is a, it, it's a uh, larger discourse, I guess, and it's like more of a personal journey. But um, what felt really confusing to me about the US is that I felt in a way rejected by the Catholic community I, I met at MIT because I looked gay, I had an undercut, and... <laughs> <laughs> but I also found... <laughs> I guess, um, but I also found that sometimes uh, interacting with, like presenting myself as gay was like, I don't know, uh, weird for people who knew I was Catholic. So I just wanted to know what your take on that is. Yeah, that, thank you for asking us that question. Um, you know, I think my journey on it has been It's not, it's not actually uh, queerness that I think conflicts. Well, no, it is that too. But um, <laughs> I just, I grew up thinking that, um, that, that the church was, um, about community and trust and doing the right thing in the world. And I'm now at the point in my life where, like, I'm still, um, for, I will always consider myself, like, ethnically Catholic, because I, I really was raised in this specific way. I can't, like, undo it in my brain. Um, but it was, it was like, in, in college, the thing that first m made me um, push away from the church was actually not coming out. It was when I like was a theology major, I read all of the stuff. And I read what the church thought about women. And um, I read like about being a vessel and why I couldn't be a priest. And it, um, it made me so sad, you know, like we are more than 50% of the world's population. And um, the Catholic Church is one of the wealthiest organizations in the world. Um, they own, they're like the third biggest landowner. They own, it's like, it's like the Queen of England the king of Saudi Arabia and the church. Um, and there's so much money and so much opportunity to do good work. And instead, like the more I investigated, I was like, oh, we went to, um, like my faith went to uh, Mexico and built churches on, you know, indigenous land or took a space that had been occupied by somebody else and killed the people in there and put a cross on it. And I... I then and then I was at BC when um, the sex abuse scandal happened here in Boston, and um, right after I graduated, I was saying backstage that like BC bought a parcel of land from the archdiocese that is butting up against the university, and that money from that was then given to survivors of sex abuse. 
they openly did this. Like, it wasn't even like a weird backdoor deal. It was like, um, BC said, like, we are buying this land from the church. And the archdiocese said, like, we are going to give to survivors. So my college tuition went to offset abuse. And I just, I, um, I don't know that I think that anybody has to make any particular decision about, like, whether you believe in certain things or whether you go to mass. I'm just somebody who thinks that we have to look at things conscientiously. And like this organization that I was born into, I feel an enormous um, responsibility to be honest about in the public realm. Like just because we have good football teams doesn't mean we're good people. <laughs> so um, that's kind of my take on it is that I just think it's like, you know, if it feels helpful to you and it feels beautiful to you and it feels like you can do good work from that, like, cool. I just also want that to come with honesty about what that organization really is and really does. Yeah, sounds like we're on the same page. Yeah, we, we actually are. But yeah. <laughs> thank you, but, but you yeah. said it so beautifully and so concisely, so yeah. thank you very yeah. much. Absolutely, yeah, cool. Again, Cameron, I, I, I so want the day to happen when your niece says, are you pooping? And someone says, yes. I know! I am, <laughs> I am pooping. Um, I want that for her too, I know! She kept waiting for someone Just to- Just someone to be pooping! Right. None of you are? Let me ask again. <laughs> um, uh, we, great follow-up question. She was not pooping. That is what we all assumed. That's how she was covering for it. Are, are you pooping? I'm not. But no, she wasn't. I don't. That would also be great if she was pooping and she wanted to just like, oh, no, that's yeah, exactly. that's him. That's not. It's what my you smell is not me. my dad. Right, yeah. That forty-year-old man. Right. right. <laughs> um, well, thank you again so much for, for coming. Um, again, I'd like to thank uh, Women and Gender Studies, um, Mind, Hand, Heart, the, the Flores Fund and Violence Prevention and Response. Thank all of you for being here. Again, Violence Prevention and Response will be outside. Our sign up is outside and we hope we see you all in the future. Thank you. Woo!